Interceptor, fuck Rejecta I'm a certified human lie detector Gonna catch ya, unexpect ya If you try and play me like an old projector Crime sector, is my nectar Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture Crime collector, free connector And I'm always gonna be a pump protector Full deflector, interceptor And I'm meaner than a specter well, that was just a, that was my sample. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Oh, come on. Yeah, there you go. I got, I, I started to get the, the beat down. All right. Okay, so you guys ready? Yeah, so let me switch screens here. And there you go. Look look how bare I made Google Earth. So just for the hell of it, I'm going to show you what... I'm going to undo every single pin that I have. Watch this craziness. Watch this. Now, I don't even know how long it's going to take to load this sucker up. But here we go. Oh, man. There you go. Oh, look at that. Look at that right there. That's every case that we've covered that I didn't lose when my I switched computers at one time. Okay, so again, if you want to live in a place where nobody's killing anybody, move right there, okay? Although you might find a, a stray body once in a while on the side of the road. Yeah, but uh, look at that. I mean, look at this. All The closer you get to the coast, the more death. Which makes sense, because there's probably more people that live in those areas. All right, now I'm going to turn that off again. And then I'm going to go back down and only turn Colorado on. Right there. Okay. Good. Now we have a blank canvas in Colorado. Doesn't that sound good? Okay. Well, the first one we're going to start off with is a young girl she's 16 years old her name is margaret peggy beck okay and this was in 1963 and this is one of the ones that's never been solved all right so a spokesman for mile high girl scout council disclosed today that foul play was involved in the death of peggy beck 16 of denver at a summer camp five miles from lake cheeseman southwest of denver 16 denver at summer camp five okay there was no immediate information on circumstances of the death the spokesman said that the girl was found dead sunday by her tent mate claudia shride of jefferson county miss shride had spent the night in the infirmary because of a cold so that the the friend wasn't with her she normally would have been with her in the tent but she was in the infirmary because of a cold but in the morning, return to the tent to prepare for the return to Denver with Miss Beck. You sort of wonder, was it somebody who, I mean, just reading that, was it somebody that knew that, uh, you know, who Miss Shride's tent mate was, knowing that she would be alone at this point? The spokesman said that Miss Beck had gone to her tent about midnight after taking part in a serenade. It was at first believed that the girl died of natural causes, but the spokesman said that the council was informed by the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office today that she had been killed. Miss Beck was the daughter of Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Beck of Denver and was a student at Denver High School. She and Miss Shride were senior Girl Scouts and were serving as program aides at the five-day Ruffett Camp for junior high school in the Pike National Forest. Let's see where that is. Wow, okay. So I guess it's a big, uh, I'll just put a pin like in the middle here so we at least have a something so far with their name. Margaret Peggy Beck. Yeah. 
right, so somewhere out here somewhere, okay? So move on, that was an article on August 19th, 1963, and then this is the following day. Officers search today for a killer, possibly scratched in the face in their investigation of the sex slang of Margaret Elizabeth Beck, 16, at a girl scout camp 35 miles southwest of Denver. Okay, so let's see where, that's probably Denver right there, I'm, I'm imagining. Thanks, Kit Kat. Strike the like freaks hugging face. Yeah, so this is about 35 miles right here. So I'll just move that pin up a little bit. <clears throat> that doesn't look right. So maybe up in that area for now. We'll probably have the name of the camp here in a minute, but. The girl was found dead Sunday morning in her sleeping bag at the Mile High... Oh, there we go. Mile High Council's Camp at the Flying G Ranch. Okay, let's see where that is. Flying G Ranch, Colorado. Okay, that didn't make sense. I mean, it made sense, but <laughs> was it in there? Uh, Mile High Council. Let's try that one. No, definitely, what do they say? No. So a lot of these names, they go away over the years and they're just not there anymore. This little girl put up a tremendous struggle, said Sheriff Harold Bray. She scratched the hell out of somebody. Well, hopefully they stored those fingernail clippings. I, it doesn't seem like it, though, because wouldn't that be one of the first cases that you would do DNA genealogy? That would be amazing to do it on this case, because that would be a very old case to track down the killer of. And he, if they scratch his face, I mean, if she scratched the killer's face, then for sure they've got uh, his DNA. Thank you, Rochelle Black. Okay, coroner Ken Rainey said the girl had been strangled and she put up a big fight and was strangled leotards and panties she wore were partially torn from her he said uh, rainy said there were thumb and fingerprints on her neck the girl was one of eight girl scout program aides all about 16 who assist at the camp in instructing younger girl scouts so she was sort of like one of the almost like a counselor in a way right she was a daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Vincent Beck of Denver. Beck is an employee of the National Bureau of Standards at Boulder. Officers said 24 campers, including three adults, slept near the girl's tent, but the nearest tent was about 30 feet away. Well, that's, yeah, that's pretty close. I mean, 30 feet's not far away at all. Uh, Bray said there was no suspect. Okay, now we're moving on to another article that was the same day. That's actually her right there. You know, 1963, she got the horn-rimmed glasses and everything. Officers searched today for a killer, possibly scratched in the face, in their investigation of the sex slaying of Margaret Elizabeth Beck, 16, a Girl Scout camp 35 miles southwest of Denver. The girl was found dead Sunday morning in her sleeping bag at the Mile High Council's camp at the Flying G Ranch. The little girl put up a tremendous struggle, said Sheriff Harold Bray. She scratched the hell out of somebody. Sounds like kind of like the similar, same article maybe, but this one had a picture. The girl's fingernails were broken, apparently from trying to ward off her attacker. Torn flesh was found under portions of her fingernails. Man, if that was today, they'd, they'd have this guy. Uh, hopefully they, did, they stored those clippings. 
Coroner Ken Rainey said the girl had been strangled. Leotards and panties were she wore were uh, partially torn from her, he said. Rainey said there were thumb and fingerprints on her neck. The girl was one of eight Girl Scout program aides, all about 16. So it's very similar to the last article, but it had that extra detail about a broken nail. And three days later, this article came out. Hunt continues. Sheriff of officers con uh, continue to search today for a bearded man suspected of strangling 16-year-old Margaret Peggy Beck, a Denver Girl Scout. The girl's body was found Sunday in her tent at the Flying G Ranch. Uh, Sheriff Harold Bray said his office has received reports of a prowler lurking in the vicinity of the campgrounds. He said, this one, isn't this weird? It sort of sounds similar to the, uh, remember that other campground case that we talked about like two months ago ish uh, god it sounds so similar it's weird I can't remember what case that was but it sounds very similar to that one the unidentified woman said to be from Conifer told officers she was accosted by a man as she walked her dogs near a creek bed in the campground area. She said the man had a, had three-day growth of beard and was wearing light-colored clothing. She said he was between 35 and 40 years old. Bray said that another report came from John Amick, an employee of the Jefferson County Highway Department. Yeah, those, the three girls in that other case. I can't remember where that was or, or even what year that was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Molly sent me a... Uh, a, uh, something uh, <laughs> an email about where the ranch is let me see where where this says it is well let me if I just type in uh, let's see Tomahawk. Supposedly in here, though. So maybe it's, uh, supposedly it's in Deckers, Colorado. Let's see. Oh wow! Look how close that was to where I put that uh, that pin. <laughs> yeah. So it's in here somewhere. Offered for the first time in 60 years, this historic Flying G Ranch since 1945. The ranch has been a Girl Scout camp, uh, barns two years around the creek, meander through the tall trees. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really have an address on there. But yeah, it's in that area, so it's pretty close to where they had the pin from the sky anyway. So somewhere around in here. Oh, I got it right here. There you go. There was a little link on there where there's an address. Oh, shit. It was closer to where I had the pin before. Flying G Girl Scout Ranch. Yeah, it's over here. I had the pin, like, right in that area. There we go. There you go, and there's the little camp with all the little cabins and everything right there. So thank you for finding that. I if there's street view out there. Didn't think there would be. Maybe maybe it just wasn't showing it. Let's see. And no, it doesn't work. 
Yeah, that's just out in the middle of nowhere. Look at that. Flying G Ranch. Okay. So it looks like they were the only person now at the 360 acres scout ramp uh, uh, camp is Alvin Slim Sherwood 67. They cleared out the whole camp, but then there was just the caretaker was still there. Okay, now we're going to go to the same year, but about two months later, October 31st. Sure, sure Bondi named suspect in Denver murder. You know, there was a couple different suspects, but they were all found to be, you know, they were cleared, basically. You know, lie detector. That's kind of lame here, though. Lie detector clears suspect in two slangs. Well, lie detector tests are, you know, that, that doesn't prove a damn thing. They indicated Stewart was truthful in denying any connection. Uh, the body of Miss, and there was another uh, murder too. So he had no connection to either the Miss Langdon or someone named Peggy, and the person we're talking about, Peggy Beck. Okay. So basically, that was it. I mean, isn't that crazy? So if I was them, I would dig through the. I'm sure there's probably a, a bigger story on it somewhere. Uh, there's this one guy in Colorado, that's a reporter who seems to get all of the details and then writes them up and puts them in sort of a, an organized way on a website. What I was frustrated with is this is the 1963 case, but all, all of the more recent ones, it's very rare to have any story at all for, for some reason in Colorado on so many of these cold case murders. I mean, there was literally like, Five of the cases I looked up couldn't find one word mention of the person. Yeah, so hopefully they collected the fingernails in a way, you know, the fingernail clippings in a way where they can actually submit that DNA today. It would be so amazing to make an arrest in that case or at least be able to say who the killer was, you know, based on DNA. be kind of hard to it'd be weird to find the children if you had any children or something and then yeah all right so now we're going to go on to the next one is 1970 let me get close these down here so we got that one that's where that took place 1970 and this one is Betty Lee Jones Here's the website. That's her picture right there. It's weird how, like, when you look back at some of these, the old pictures, people look older. Like, if you looked at her, you'd think, oh, okay, what, about 30? But, you know, she's only 23. It's kind of the haircut. The clothing was more conservative. So it just lent, you know, made you think, when you look at it now, that they're older than they are. So Betty Lee Jones, on March 9, 1970, the body of a female was found dumped off the side of Highway 128, 20 feet north of the Jefferson Boulder County line. So let's see if we can find that one. So Highway 128, Highway 128, Colorado. Okay, it's right there. So just, I'm just gonna put a, a temporary pin on that. So it looks like it's going this way. And I wonder if that's Jeff, look how close that is to that county there. Let's see if that's gonna be it. Those green 
boxes or the counties? These borders here. Okay, Broomfield. Let me see where. Uh, Okay, it was Jefferson and Boulder. Okay, Jefferson County. Okay, so this is Jefferson County. That's exactly what this is right there, that line. And then the other one was, was it? Boulder. Yeah, Boulder. So that's Jefferson right near the pin there. And then Boulder County. I'm kind of thinking that's where I am. Yeah. So that's weird. Yeah, so that is Boulder County right there. Boulder. Jefferson, so that is exactly what I was saying. I was just noticing how close that Highway 128 goes along there, so I would think that it would be somewhere in this area, and it's in Boulder County, so it's north of the Green Line. All right. Dump off the side of Highway 128, 20 feet north of the Jefferson Boulder County line in Boulder County. The body was identified as Betty Lee Jones. She had been shot multiple times. Jones was last seen the day before in the early afternoon arguing, arguing with her husband of nine days. So she'd only been married nine days, got in an argument. And it was an argument in front of the residence, and a residence was 1216 York Street Drive in Denver. So let's see. 1216 York Street, Denver. Uh, what is it, a condo? Might have been different in 1963, though. Oh, or 1970, I mean. Uh, let's take a look at that. See if we think it's been there. It's right there. That could have been there, right? There it is. One two one six. Does that look? That looks like that could have been there since '63, doesn't it? Right there. Um, he started to drive away from the area and saw her get into a blue. Yeah, doesn't this sound like that other story we just covered last night? Listen to that. That's crazy, right? So he claims that they got in an argument outside, and then he saw her get into a, a blue 1962 Chevrolet Malibu. 1961 or 62. When he drove around the block, she, uh, so when he drove around the block, she and the car were gone. Four suspects were identified and eliminated through DNA testing. Well, you know, you'd think they probably would have tested his DNA. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to please contact the Boulder County Sheriff's Office. But here's the thing is, you know, if they haven't tested his DNA, they might want to try to do that. But at the same time, if she got into a blue car... And what, 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 what was she doing getting into a car just sort of really quickly with somebody that's going to kill her? 
I know, it's crazy. It sounds almost identical. I was just thinking that. This is the newspaper article. She was murdered on March 9th. That's when she disappeared. And this says, Sheriff officers at Boulder said today that a woman slain Monday has been identified as Betty Lee Jones. This is the only reference to her in the entire newspaper system, you know, over the years. Like, you wouldn't you have done a follow-up or anything? Officers said the woman wore a wedding ring on one finger, but declined further details. The deputy county coroner, William Howe, said the woman had been shot three times, twice in the head, and once in the abdomen. Yeah, it's so similar to the one from yesterday, isn't it? And this is a little bit more about her. Betty Jones' body was found by highway maintenance workers, yet again, early on the morning of Monday, March 9th, 1970. That's my brother's birthday, by the way. That seems to be popping up a lot. Haven't I told you guys that, that this March 9th date? Just, I mean, it's been coming up a lot in these cases. It's really weird. In a field on the north side of Highway 128, just inside the Boulder County line, approximately three-fourths of a mile west of Jefferson County Airport. Well, there you go. Let's, let's see if we can get that even a little bit closer. Thanks, Linda Howe, as in Linda Molden Howe and the cattle mutilations. Gray, I appreciate your work on these cases, Hart. Well, thank you. I I like doing them. They're, you know, they're so, um, you know, I've never heard of any of these. That's why they're interesting. I, I get tired of the same ones over. Hey, Gray, Gray, have you covered the, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Jefferson County Airport. Okay. Well, there's, how about right there, maybe? Oh, I can see this. So, here it's close to, but then it goes down, and then it comes back up, right in this area. And I bet you anything, it's near where this golf course, let's see, it said, three quarters of a mile west of the Jefferson County Airport. Well, there's, I think, you know, you might be, you're probably even counting this here, so right in that little strip there. And I bet you that golf course wasn't there in 1960. Let's, do a, let's measure this out. So three quarters of a mile. Let's say that that's, let's just pretend that's the airport. Okay, that's three quarters right there. Although, wait, we're, we're in a different county now, though. So it has to be right there. Right in this area. Right? Wait, hold on. Let, let's make sure. So it's that county. So this county and this county has to be right in here. Like right there. That's 0.88, but I might just be a little bit off on the uh, let's, where the, where to start. I bet you anything it's like right there. That makes sense. Let's take a look at that. You're driving by and you just and how do they describe that yeah in a field that's exactly what that is right I mean I'm, I feel really confident that that's the location right there it's only about 20 feet uh, it's actually right 20 feet from the county line so it'd be like you know, right in that area And let's just say it could be here, anywhere right in this location, right there. Heck, let's just put it right there. That makes it closer to the 0.75. Let's see what it looked like um, prior.
Yeah, that's 1999. Yep, the golf course is still there. Okay, so back to this. Uh, three quarters of a mile west of the Jefferson County Airport, she had been shot twice in the head and once in the torso with a 38 caliber weapon. The murder weapon, a ROM, or R-O-H-M, 38 Special Revolver was used in the killing, was recovered by Longmont PD in a drug raid in November 1970, so you know, eight months later. The owner of the weapon was identified and eliminated from consideration by DNA evidence in 2006. Wow. <laughs> so they had to wait 36 years just to test that guy. They probably thought he was a suspect all those years. Um, obviously, she must have been either raped or something for, yeah, see, that's what's weird. Uh, you know, why would the husband, if, it's obviously not the husband's DNA that they recovered from her. You'd think for sure they would have tested him. But again, it does sound like that other story, but man, they must have cleared him. Detective Ainsworth has done an extensive amount of work tracking down three persons of interest but has yet to establish probable cause, and the case remains open. So that is it for that one. Let me move this over here, though. Get rid of the other one so I don't have extras. And save it. And that one is done. That's one I sort of feel like I want to call up about. Hell, all of them. You know, the fingernail clippings. Did you save the damn things? Okay, now we're moving to 1980. Okay? And this one is Stephanie Bauman. And uh, she's only 15. In October 20th, 1980, uh, Arapahoe County Sheriff's officers were dispatched to County Road 173 near US 36. So let's see where that is. County Road. Okay, so County Road. 173, hopefully that shows up. Okay, there it is. And that says 173 Front Street. It's this one right here, way over here. Okay, so let me put that there for now near US 36. Well, look at that. <laughs> that was right there randomly. Okay. So it's Highway 36. So we'll just say, you know, in this area. And her name is Stephanie Ann Bauman. Her body was bruised and left lying in a ditch. Stephanie died of hypothermia. Stephanie reportedly lived in a group home but had run away. She is reported to have left the group home approximately two weeks prior to her death and re was reported to have stayed with different acquaintances prior to her death. Anyone with information regarding this case is asked to please contact the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office. Okay, now, this is this guy right here does some, um, not that, I don't know, what the hell was that? It switched over to a drone deal. Okay. This guy right here, he does amazing, I don't know what it is, but he's got like a thousand articles on different unsolved cases. And they're all part, look at the Denver Post cold cases. And he gets a lot of the information. Look how long. So we get to have four pages of information now. All right. And so I'm just giving you what I find. And then if this guy wrote something, I get his stuff too. 
because it fills in a lot of the information. The last hour of 15-year-old runaway Stephanie Ann Bau Bauman's life was hellish. Yeah, you should hear this. I read part of this earlier. It's crazy shit. Someone or a group of people apparently forced her to disrobe in sub-freezing temperatures. By the way, this guy's name is Kirk Mitchell. All of the links are in the description of the video. Someone or a group of people apparently forced her to disrobe in sub-freezing temperatures on October 28, 1980, near a windmill in rural Arapahoe County. She may have been beaten and sexually assaulted. Let, let's, let's check and see if there's still a windmill. Those things sometimes last. I'm just going to go here and look around. And it could be on the other side also of the highway there. And this Google Earth is horrible. It's uh, 19, what year is this? 2009, 19. Uh, yeah, I don't really see. It's hard to make it out because it's so blurry. There could be a windmill out there somewhere. Now listen to this part here. At some point, she ran barefoot so they could find, they could see all this, and nude down a trail on a dirt road for four miles in a desperate attempt to escape her tormentor. There was evidence she was followed by a car filled with as many as five people who harassed her and prevented her from seeking help. Exhausted, she fell in a ditch and froze to death after wandering in circles. She must have been terrified, said her sister, Cindy Bobble, 49, of Woodbridge, VA. She probably felt there was no one there in the world for her. It breaks your heart. The, sh the shitty part about this is it doesn't sound like, I mean, uh, you know, I hate, you know, it sounds stupid to say, wow, I hope she was assaulted. Because that's the only way you're going to catch somebody at this point unless somebody tells somebody. But if they left DNA behind, then there's a way to catch them now. But, I mean, this is just a freaking nightmare, right? Yeah, exactly. Bauman lived a sad life. Her father, Robert Bauman, 73 of Missouri, said she had a a hard life as a youngster. When she was young, her parents were divorced and she alternated between living with her mother in St. Louis and her father in Littleton. Although Stephanie did well in school, Bauman was worried that she was using drugs. She ran away from home a few times, saying she was going to her mother's house. Finally, Bauman said he placed her in a group home for troubled teenagers. Rapo County Sheriff investigators say the group home had strict rules and Stephanie and a friend ran away. For about two weeks, Stephanie moved from home to home. Shortly before her body was found, she was talking about returning home. She never made it. Some people speculated that Stephanie had met a pimp and that he demanded something she wasn't willing to do. Two witnesses would tell police that earlier in the morning on October 28th, they saw a late model silver Lincoln sedan with four women inside. The two in the front seat appeared to be dressed and acting like prostitutes, according to a Denver Post article written at the time. Well, I couldn't find any of those. It was a, and that could just be that newspapers.com didn't upload it. Okay. On October 20th, they saw a late model silver Lincoln sedan with four women inside. The two in the front seat appeared to be dressed and acting like prostitutes, according to a Denver Post article written at the time. It was a conspicuous sight on dirt roads about five miles south of Byers at that hour in the morning. Uh, what hour? 
the two in the front. What, what hour are you talking about? Oh, at that, oh, just at that hour in the morning. Okay. Many hours later, one of them, one of the same witnesses saw the silver Lincoln, but this time there were only three women inside the car. Hmm. Almost like, like they brought her along to maybe become one. She said, forget it. And then they just tortured her and left her to die out in the cold. Early the next morning, a passing motorist on County Road 173 near US 36 did a double take before stopping his car and confirming a gruesome sight. Laying in a ditch on the side of the road was the nude, bruised body of a girl or young woman. The cause of death was hypothermia. But with no identification, authorities couldn't figure out who she was. A Denver Post employee, Bonnie Timmons, drew an illustration of what the young person would look like using an autopsy photograph of her face. Let's see. Okay, so they couldn't figure out who she was for a while, I guess. Former Denver Post reporter Dana Parson gave a detailed account of the last hours of the young girl's life according to facts provided by former Sheriff Sergeant Ron Martin. According to Martin's account, reported by Parson, uh, Parsons, the girl's nightmare began near a rickety windmill and water... Let's see, in water uh, trough filled with frozen water just off County Road 161. Is that what, what we have here? Let's see where County Road 161 is. County Road 161. That's way over here. Because they, they did say she traveled. So this is where the windmill would be at. Around in here somewhere. Is this still 161? Let's see how far four miles is. So up, up in that area, let's see. Ah, there's no, no street view there. Is there one there though? Right on that. I know there's a street view. I could see the green. Hold on. Well, I guess not. Oh. Now let's see if from right here if we could see a windmill across the way. Yeah, it's hard to say, hard to say. But somewhere on this county road, this is where the nightmare began. I think it's kind of in this area up here because it, that's right around in the four mile range that was mentioned. Okay. According to Martin's account, reported by Parsons, the girl's nightmare began near a rickety windmill and water trough filled with frozen water just off County Road 161. Investigators found a pile of girls' clothes along with a man's camel-colored size 42 coat. There were blue jeans, a light blue sweater, running shoes, one white sock with green and yellow striping and women's underwear. So they probably made her undress right there. I wonder why the man's jacket was there. Was she wearing that too? Was she nude prior? You know, it's hard to say. Parsons gave the following account of her steps 
after she left the windmill. So they must have been able to, there must have been either snow on the ground or, because it did say the water was frozen or the ground was muddy, something like that, where they could definitely make out her footprints. From there, the girl walked briskly or ran down a dirt path to County Road 161. She walked on the left side of the road, which had a shallow ditch beside it. Now we can't see it, so it doesn't matter. No street view. Martin estimated it was about 4 a.m. She headed south. At one point, footprints indicate she walked down into the ditch, then back out, slipping in the dirt as she did. At another point, she apparently walked into the middle of the dirt road. Along the way, she should have been able to see the lights from at least three farmhouses that were less than a mile away. Why didn't she seek refuge? If someone was with her, did the person or persons prevent her, or did she want to stay on the road, perhaps knowing where she was going? At no point along her four-mile route did investigators find any footprints other than those of the woman. She walked along 161 for about three-tenths of a mile. Then she came to its intersection with Colorado 30. Okay, let's check. Now, now we can sort of figure this out here. All right. Colorado 30. Is that going to just show up? Yeah. Did they say? Is that what they said? Hmm. The extension of Quincy Avenue. Okay, let's try that. That doesn't make any... What's going on here? <laughs> the extension of Quincy Avenue. What are you talking about? It's not even close to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be like County Road 30. Let's just kind of look around here. Okay, there's County Road 34, 46, so it's up this way. Is that 30 right there then? Okay. But yeah, there's 26, 30, 34, okay, that's 30. All right, that was pretty close to where we had that anyway, so let's see what we're talking about here. She walked along 161 for about three-tenths of a mile when she came to the intersection with Colorado 30. So she was heading south on 161 right here, and we got the three-tenths of a mile starting right there. That's three-tenths. So that's where... They have her, not in that area. When I say they, I mean the article. I wonder if there's a street view on 30 here. Yeah, there we go. So this is right here. She was, she was standing right in this area right here. Street view ends right there, though. <laughs> right where you needed it to go. Just a little bit more. No, oh, jeez. Right. So, anyways, she went like this to here. And so she was right there. I'm not reading any comments. I haven't seen a comment for 20 minutes.
61, uh, three tenths of a mile when she came to the intersection of Colorado, Colorado 30. She followed that highway for about 2.8 miles when it ended and turned into County Road 173. Okay. Now we already did that one, so that would be, yeah, oh, there you go, see it ends right there. So then she walked this way. Wow, this is crazy. See that? And then look, look at it, it even says Quincy Avenue right there. So it went this way and then boom. And then this is the County Road 173. Quincy Avenue, she followed that highway for about 2.8 miles when it ended and turned into County Road 173. But along Colorado 30, something telling might have happened. At one point, car tire tracks made it clear that a car drove partway into the ditch, then back out again. At the same point, footprints indicate the woman was standing with her back practically up against a wire fence about 20 feet off the road, clearly struggling, she was getting out of the way of the car. Again, the questions, the questions, was the car driven by someone harassing the woman, or was it a passing motorist who lost control temporarily? Well, I mean, that's pretty unlikely, right? If so, and assuming the driver saw the woman, why wasn't help summoned? Because it wasn't somebody that lost control. Another troubling aspect of the case arose at that point. From then on, investigators can't identify any more tire tr marks along the route the woman walked. That doesn't pr prove the car didn't continue following her, Martin said, if that's what it had been doing. It simply is a matter of physical evidence disappearing there. Martin reasons if the car did abandon her why wouldn't she retrace her steps and go back after her clothing? I mean, asking whys like that sometimes are just absolutely meaningless. That's not one of the ones that I would be curious about. I'd be like, she's cold as hell, and she didn't have a clue where she was. It's pitch dark. I, look, I, here's what I'll tell you. In a place like that, at nighttime, you wouldn't be able to see a damn thing. It, all you could see is maybe a light here and there. It would be absolutely pitch black out there. And you're freezing. And you are, uh, you know, just, it's a nightmare. In any event, the woman continued walking. She reached the end of Colorado 30 and turned north. That's exactly what we have right here. Let's see. Let's see if we can find any spot that's on. There we go. Finally, we get. We can actually go exactly where she was. This is where she was walking. Hell, it probably looked similar to this, but it was dark outside. 4 a.m., right? And, you know, there's ditches on the side. So she's going around like this. Man, this, this is this one's a really crazy ass story here. I mean, this right, and then now right here, see how it gets up here, and then it starts heading north right now. And oh, look, there's actually a car out here in the middle of nowhere. That's the killer, everybody. That's the killer. Yeah, and look at the road's pretty muddy still. It's not like it's totally paved or anything. So she went walking in that direction. She reached the end of Colorado 30 and then turned north on the 173. She was about to walk the final mile of her life. 
Okay, so when they say a mile, let's see how far that is then. See, I have her way up here, but it definitely could be, you know, we're just talking about a mile here, so let's see what we got. So right here, right when she turned, they're saying a mile. Oh, so she only made it to, like, right here-ish. Not even close. Right around in that area. Well, I guess we should be able to see a. Uh... No, let's just keep reading it. She walked about a half mile where her footprints. So she walked. Uh... She was about to walk the final mile of her life. She walked about a half mile where her footprints indicate she was walking in the middle of the dirt road. So that's absolutely what we're looking at there. Still a dirt road all these years later. She was about to walk, uh, excuse me. Um, she stayed there until she collapsed a few hundred yards further on. Indications are she slumped off to the side of the road rolled over into the shallow ditch and died. Martin estimates she died around 6 a.m. Uh, based mainly on the fact that the road becomes more heavily traveled about 6.30 a.m. And had she still been walking, he thinks someone would have seen her. Man, that's crazy. She would have just, if it was just a little bit later, she would have lived. Oh boy, here's that old pesky varmint from a long time ago. Oh boy. The crazy conspiracy wacko from the... I'm just kidding. Remember that from the area stays? You always had those crazy... Yeah. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, so let's see. I'm going to go, I'm going to put this in here. Let's just see if we can, this is her final journey right here. Yeah, just think how lonely that would have been. Now look at it, it stops right there. <laughs> Almost right at that half mile mark that they were talking about. So, anyways, that's where, where that is. Let's see what else it says. Indication, indications are she slumped off to the side of the road, rolled over into a shallow ditch, and died. Martin estimates she died around 6 a.m. based mainly on the fact that the road becomes more heavily traveled about 6.30 a.m. And had she still been walking, he thinks someone would have seen her. Then there's a final page. The witness who saw three women parked southbound on County Road 173 at 9 a.m. would tell authorities the woman appeared to be upset. Huh. Um, they were about four and a half miles north of where Stephanie's body was found, according to Parsons' article. The witness stopped with the intention of asking the woman if they needed 
help, but the Lincoln did a difficult U-turn on the narrow road, pulled on the Highway 36 and headed west. But according to Martin, the young women's clothes didn't appear to be those of a prostitute. Authorities put the witness under hypnosis. Oh, Jesus, really? Uh, but he could not recall the license plate number of the silver car. Yeah. Uh, when Parsons' article and Timmons' illustration of the dead girl or woman appeared in the Denver Post on November 9, 1980, Jean Beaumont, Robert Beaumont's second wife, was in the kitchen talking with her aunt about the horrifying story of the unidentified woman who had been stripped and froze to death. Jean Bowman suddenly got a horrible thought and looked at the illustration. It was a close resemblance to Stephanie. Robert uh, Bauman, I mean, maybe it's Bauman, said he was taken to the county's corner, uh, the county coroner's office. There on a table was her daughter. Her body was completely covered except for her head. I identified her body, he said. Bobble said her death was, has tortured him for 30 years. It's devastated the family, he said. Whoever did this was just evil, she said. Some people think it was a pimp that she said no to the wrong person. Someone is getting away with murder. When she went to her sister's funeral and the casket was closed, it was finally sunk in to Bobble the horror of what had happened. I'm sure it was torment. That's the worst part. It took me 15 years to stop being angry, Bobble said. Still, she would like to talk to whomever caused her sister's death. Maybe someone knows what happened, will say someday, feel compassion, and tell what they know, she, she said. I can't, it's hard to, oh man, my eyes are getting dry and... You, ever, you guys ever watch when I'm doing the show? I'm blinking my... I'm going to put uh, Pesky Varmint on timeout just for the sake of doing it. Too much typing. Too many comments that aren't, that aren't interesting. All right, let's see. Um, according to Jefferson County investigators, DNA was taken from the crime scene. Now, there you go. So maybe she was raped. And could someday help identify the killer or killers? Wow. So, man. I mean, I'm hoping Colorado gets moving here and starts to uh, quickly um, start doing some DNA testing. You know? I mean, there's so many of these cases. It seems like they've got DNA. There's just this huge backlog, it seems like. I think that would be one of the greatest things to do is just you know get the GEDmatch database built up again and then go out and get way more genealogists out there and let's go get these old cases solved seriously and we need to get the funding needs to be in place it's way more important you know and I think you do the, the rape kits at the same time because they're related Yeah, well, they're trying to, they've been working with the DNA Dope Project on a couple cases over there, I know that. Uh, we have one of them. We, we gathered $2,500. Hey, thanks, Helen Mitchell. Yeah, today's show took a long time to gather information. So uh, don't forget, everybody, we're trying to, you know, we're getting the super chats and everything for the larger percentage donations that we've been able to make. Love your channel. Yeah, there's tons of different cases out there. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it says it right here at the bottom. I was just getting to that point. Thanks, though, for... Jesus. Uh, detectives say they believe Bauman's case is tied to those of as many as 37 others in Denver metro area. You know, maybe. You know, there's just a whole bunch of cases that are not solved in that area. Tons and tons. Okay? That's why I even have a show tonight that has um, six of them. So we just did three, okay? All right. So the... Um, 
The next case is Susie Becker, 1982, okay? And again, I don't want people typing in stuff about the cases that I'm covering unless I've moved on to the next one, okay? Because that's just how it is. <laughs> it really gets really, 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 really frustrating when people do that. I don't like it. All right, so now we're on to Susie Becker, 1982. And here is the, this one is a good one because it was solved. Uh, but I think they think that maybe it was connected to another one also. So Susie Becker. And here's what it says in uh, one of the articles I was looking at. Susie Becker's partially decomposed body, her, her partially decomposed body was found by a couple of fishermen on July 1st, 1982. The body was discovered beneath a blanket on a slope on the north side of Boulder Canyon, west of Sugarloaf Road. So let's see where that is. Boulder can or how about just Sugar Loaf Road. Okay, here's Sugarloaf Road. Uh, let's see. It was found by a couple fishermen. And she was discovered beneath a blanket on a slope on the north side of Boulder Canyon, west of Sugarloaf Road. North side of Boulder Canyon. Let's see where that is. Yeah, so is that an actual road? Wow, how come this seems like this is so close? Haven't we covered this one? Susie Becker. Remember, doesn't this look exactly like the one where it took me a long time, but I found that little creek that there was a body in. And it was just like, wow, it seems like it was exactly in the same. Let me turn this back, all this stuff back on really quick. See what happens. Oh, crap. I got to move this up. Hold on. And now I'm turning everything back on again. I just thought that there was some... It might even be a totally different... Yeah. Look, look, look at all the stuff that I have in Colorado. Or in uh, Denver. I mean, that's just... Come on, Denver. And maybe it was a whole different case or state and everything. I just, my mind was thinking it came off to the side there. Okay, so there is Sugarloaf. And that's, so the Sugarloaf come in like that. Boulder Canyon. God, I, I, God, I totally remember this road and everything. It's bizarre. Yeah, it's weird. But anyways, let me get back to the, uh, we'll, we'll figure something out here in a bit. Sugarloaf Road, and then Boulder Canyon. I'll just put a pin right here. Sugarloaf and Boulder Canyon. Okay. 
Meet the blanket on a slope on the north side of Boulder Canyon, west of Sugarloaf Road, approximately four miles west of Boulder. No, okay, this is Boulder right there. And they're saying just west of Sugarloaf, so somewhere around in this area, somewhere over here. Let's see what it looks like. On a slope on the north side of Boulder Canyon West. So just like on that side maybe. And, you know, laying on the slope with a tarp over her. West of Sugarloaf Road, approximately four miles west of Boulder. An autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed repeatedly, but that many of the wounds were superficial. Uh, no motive for the death was ever established, and no suspects were ever identified. So this, this article here was, I think it was like 2010-ish. Uh, this is her right there. And here is a an article from uh, what year is this one? Let's see. Boulder County Sheriff Detectives closes case on the 1982 stabbing of Boulder woman. Let me let me see if that other guy. I think he wrote one. Is this it right here? Let's see. Yeah, let's do this. This guy's well. This one's pretty short, so let's see what he says. The fishermen were looking for a good spot to fish in a stream. We could just see that stream on the left side there. Running down a ravine in Boulder Canyon on July 1st, 1982, when they came across a horrific scene. They discovered the decaying body of a young woman who was covered only by a towel. And see, this article was June 1st, 2013. And it's weird because it doesn't seem like he knows that it was solved because literally the day before were the articles when it was solved. So I, I don't know if he was all was writing it and put it out there, but it's it's kind of weird when you look at June 1st, 2013 there. There were 11 knife wounds in her chest and two in her neck. Next to her right hand was a knife with a black handle, tests would later determine that the knife was not the murder weapon. So maybe it was hers, maybe she was trying to defend herself, I don't know. Or just was put there for some unknown reason. A backpack was close by. Boulder County Sheriff investigators were called to the scene near the 3200 block of Boulder Canyon Drive. Okay, let's 32,000. I mean. So let's see how close we are here. Thirty-two thousand. God, not even. That's way further away. Is that four miles? Let's do the miles part here. Yeah, see where I have it's closer to four miles. See that right there. This is eight. Right there. I don't know. Not feeling confident on that. Uh, identification of the the backpack indicated let's see next to the right hand was a knife a backpack was close by so maybe that's where the backpack was found okay let's do that even though that's four miles away I guess that's sort of nearby you know like sounds a little bit like Schnee Oberholzer now Same state. Identification in the backpack indicated the woman's remains were those of Susan Susie Becker, a 20-year-old woman who was last seen by a friend on the morning of June 20th, 1982. Susan liked to hang out at the Pearl Street Mall in Boulder. 
She often went on dates with two young men. Sparks were flying, but not exactly the way Susan wished they would. She liked one of the boyfriends a lot, but he wasn't that interested in her. The other friend liked her a lot. The other friend liked her a lot, but she didn't feel the same way about him. It's kind of like that one story we talked about last night with the guy that went into the, uh, in uh, Idaho, went into the, the uh, school on surveillance. Remember that weird scenario with the, he liked this one girl, the girl didn't like him. She liked this other guy, but that guy didn't like her. Identification of the backpack indicated that the woman's remains were of oh, Susan. Okay, then let's go down here. Uh, she liked one of the boyfriends a lot, but he wasn't interested in her. The other friend liked her a lot, but she didn't. The other friend liked her a lot, but she didn't feel the same way about him. Friends described Susan as a free spirit. She had grown up in Boulder and liked to smoke marijuana. She was planning to travel to Idaho, ironically, weeks after her disappearance for a gathering of the Rainbow family. Oh, Jesus. Probably friends with, uh, would have been great friends with Sarah. Hart. Raised a Catholic, Susan liked to listen to Nyabinji music, chanting, and drum beats of the Rastafarian lifestyle. Okay. So let's check this out. So this is an article from May 30th, 2013. And like I just said, look at the date on this guy's article, June 1st. Like, he just wasn't even aware that they just solved it. He just happened to put this out because he doesn't mention anything about it being solved. Hey, there goes Chloe getting going nuts. So, this is 2013, the day before that other article. Boulder police say they solved a cold case murder. They believe the killer is John Argue. So it's hard to read this article because his name is Argue. A man who died in 2009 of an accidental drug overdose. In a statement re released by police Thursday, investigators say Argue murdered Susan Becker in 1982. The Boulder County Sheriff's Office has concluded its cold case investigation into the 1982 murder of Susan Becker. Technology advances definitively linked Argue to the 1982 murder a technology unavailable at the time. The Larimer County Sheriff's Office announced the DNA evidence and comparison oh, there goes my stomach, in 2010. Boulder County Sheriff's detectives said Argue lived in Longmont at the time of Becker's 1982 murder. Investigators linked Argue to several cases involving assaults to other women in the Boulder Longmont area, including the death of his neighbor, 94-year-old Orma Smith. Boulder County investigators worked with Larmer County and Illinois law enforcement officials, reevaluated Argue's potential involvement in Miss Becker's death. The Federal Bureau of Investigation Behavioral Analysis Unit continued to investigate Argue, having been involved in other homicides as a possible serial killer. Argue previously convicted and sentenced to serve 20 to 50 years in Illinois prison for killing his 14-year-old sister-in-law, Susan Marion, in 1966. Look at that. He killed his... He was supposed to serve 20 to 50 years in prison for killing his 14-year-old sister-in-law. And that was in 1966. But he was re re uh, paroled in 82. That means he sh uh, served a whopping 16 years. See, th this murder, all these other murders after he was paroled, should be, they're all on the idiots in law enforcement, you know, not law enforcement, but the judicial system that let him out. And it's just an embarrassment. I mean, really, God. 
See, this girl would have lived had he just served his minimum of 20 years, okay? Upon his release, Argue initially moved to Boulder and then to Longmont shortly thereafter. In the summer of 82, police say Argue was accused and considered a person of interest in the murders of Becker and Smith. Isn't that interesting? So they even thought he had something to do with it back then. But they never had enough evidence to arrest him. According to police records, a woman's decomposing body was pulled out of a ravine near Boulder Canyon Drive by several fishermen. That's the one we're talking about. On July 1st, 1982, the body was later identified as 20-year-old Susan Becker. Argue figured as a person of interest in the investigation, however, declined to cooperate with investigators, said Sergeant Jason Olkers. Statements provided to investigators by Argue's family placed him in the hiking area where Becker's body was found. Wow. There was not enough evidence to link him to Miss Becker's murder. See, that's what's so beautiful about DNA, everybody. It's awesome. Several days later, Argue was arrested and convicted for attempting to abduct a 26-year-old University of Colorado female student at Knife Point. Wasn't that just enough right there? <laughs> that was on July 15th. So that was just, uh, what, what day was it? Her body, Decker's body, was found on July 9th. And then he goes and abducts somebody else. Wow. After serving his sentence in Colorado Department of Corrections for that abduction, Argue was returned to Illinois in 1984. So he only served two years for this one after he had killed somebody else and served 16 years. Are you guys idiots? Seriously. After serving a sentence in the Colorado Department of Corrections for the abduction, Argue was returned to Illinois in 1984 to complete the sentence for murdering his sister-in-law. Okay, so that now he was sent back because he was on parole, right? So they were like, whoa, now, okay, that, that's good then, I guess. His arrest and conviction in, let's see, his arrest and conviction of kidnapping in Colorado says in of was a violation of his parole in Illinois. There you go. FBI investigators reviewed the case involving Argue and concluded that it was highly probable that he was responsible for Susan Becker's uh, murder. Uh, they agreed that there was probable cause to believe that Mr. Argue was responsible for Susan Becker's death and that if he were still alive, they would pursue murder charges against him. Yes. Well, especially since the DNA evidence matched. And you sort of wonder how many other people this guy killed. So, anyways, that's story number four. Are you guys, uh, is this interesting at all? I'm going to take a break.
Nee. Okay, now the, moving on to number five here. Jessica Arendando. Yeah, let's see. Let me do some of these news. There was some newspaper.com. But these were way after. Hey, thanks, Helen Mitchell. I was wondering if uh, the show just must have sucked. <laughs> All those hours getting the information. Uh, let's see. Psychologists classified him as dangerous. There was a guy. So let me let me do this differently. Actually, I'm just going to start off with that guy. He's got a better article. On. Thank you, Helen Mitchell. Yeah, they're outside right now for a minute playing. All right, so the last hours of 15-year-old runaway. Did we already do this one? I think this is the wrong one. This is Bauman. I'm trying to, it's in the wrong, uh, that's the one I had up earlier. I knew that was the one I already did, hold on. Kit Kat. Oh, you know what I had tonight, Kit Kat? I had a uh, a mint dark chocolate uh, Kit Kat. That was pretty good. I have to be honest with you. Hey! Thank you, Claudia Neubauer, Kit Kat, and Helen Mitchell. Yeah, it was pretty damn good. If you guys haven't had one of the um, mint chocolate Kit Kats... You should go try one with the uh, dark chocolate. The only problem is then I bought a Snickers as well. <laughs> oh, and then... Uh... Hey, thanks, Wally Gator. Oh, it's okay. You guys are always got the uh, the generous uh, hearts. What's what, what's weird is is the randomness of it. <laughs> you know, it's like you the I don't know. It's weird the randomness of each night. The Twirl Kit Kat. I haven't had that one. What do they have for flavors in there? You know what sucks is I had to pay my estimated taxes today on all of the, you know, my YouTube and Patreon funds. That wasn't too fun. But it won't affect our donation. And that's coming up pretty soon. You know, doesn't it seem like the months are flying, months, M-U-N-T-S, are going by way quicker <laughs> for some reason? Like these weeks just being like, bing, 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 bing. I mean, the older you get, the quicker life goes. That sucks. I wish it was the other way around. Hey, thanks, Trace Ellen. Hey, did you hear my rap at the beginning of the, uh, I did your Gray rap. beaming face with smiling eyes, beaming face with smiling eyes, rolling on the floor, laughing, beaming face with smiling eyes, beaming face with smiling eyes. Luva, why you? Yeah, did you hear the uh, the intro? You got to go back and listen. Wow, look at there's Jen Richards. How you feeling today? <laughs> That's so kind. Thank you. Yeah, it was like a dark chocolate and that sort of green looking. Yeah, you must not have heard it, Trace Elements. This is like the... 
half-time intermission right now. My main people, love y'all, always. Well, thank you, Jen Richards. Of course, she sent me an email, but not her address for, so I could send her the mug. Okay. You've never had a Kit Kat. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was somewhere around in here somewhere. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm trying to find that, that part. There we go. Right there. Here we go. This is just for you, Trace Elements, since you missed it. Here we go. You missed it, so here we go. Prime Deceptor, Fun Rejector, I'm a certified human lie detector, gonna get ya, on a spectra, if you try and play me like an old projector, Crime Sector, is my nectar, Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture, Crime Collector, Free Connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, Food Deflector, and a scepter, and I'm meaner than a spectre, with a vector. <laughs> Anyways, there you go, there you go. I'm still working on it. I got to get the, the full thing through, maybe a different sound on a different part, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's probably differently than the way you would do it. But. Certified lie detector. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You wrote you wrote a good one there, Trace Elements. I could tell right after right after I realized it went with it. Or you could make it go with it. Okay, here we go. We've got the, uh, this is the next case here. Jessica Arendando. I'm sure there's probably like a trilled R in there. I just can't do that. And I know the ones that can trill it are doing it right now in their living room. I just can't hear you to realize how good it was when you did it. November 25th, 1988, Jessica Arendando was last seen when she dropped her boyfriend off at Neal's, a bar in Glendale, south of Denver. I wonder if that's still there. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Was there one called Neil's? Hmm. Yeah. Problem with bars is they change their name every few years, if you know, unless they're been there a long time, you know. Hard to know, hard to know. Jessica Rondo's car, a red 1988 Mustang convertible, was found abandoned a few blocks from the bar at East 7th and Jackson. So let's see where that is. Maybe there's a bar near there. Let's see, East 7th and Jackson. Denver. Okay, right there. So that's East 7th and Jackson. So that's where her Mustang was found. 
This guy, this this is one that might be a serial killer here. In this case right here. Mustang found. And it's a red one. And let me put her name so I know it. This is Jessica Arendando. Okay, so her red 1988 Mustang convertible was found abandoned a few blocks from the bar at East, the bar at East 7th and Jackson. So was the bar at East 7th or was that when the car was? Was Jessica's? How would you guys read that sentence? A red 1988 Mustang convertible was found abandoned a few blocks from the bar. So it was, it was found, the bar wasn't at East 7th and Jackson. It was, that's where the car was found. Okay. So let's see, we'll type in um, closest bars to, oh, there, okay, there you go. There's the bar car there and College Inn, a few blocks, they're saying. So I would say it's one of these two, wouldn't you? I would I I would say the College Inn is what that used to be. Because that's a few blocks, right? This is just one. What do you guys think? I'm pro I'm thinking that this College Inn bar was probably the one. Unless there was a bar that's closed down, but I don't think it's one of these. These are too far away. That's just right there. No, one of these two. Witnesses said she'd been abducted from the accident site. So here's what's crazy, right? Uh, okay, it says, and appeared to have been in an accident. So her car looked like it had been hit. Witnesses said she had been abducted from the accident site by several unknown male suspects. Okay, so this guy wrote something up on it right here. The same guy. And uh, this one's a little bit longer than normal, but that's because it's combined with another case also. Because if you look back in 1994, suspect has a history of sex offense. Robert Elliot Harlan left, and that's actually her. That's his, This is Jessica... Um, Arendando. This is the first time her name shows up in a newspaper. Is eight six years after her murder. At least one month before casino worker. At least that I could find. Casino worker Rhonda Lee Maloney. So this is somebody totally different. Disappeared. A Denver psychologist classified her suspected abductor Robert Elliot Harlan as a dangerous sex offender who needed close supervision. Harlan, 29, has been arrested for investigation of kidnapping and attempted first-degree murder. He is suspected of abducting the 25-year-old Maloney as she got off work. This is a totally different person we're talking about here. As she got off work early Saturday and, let's see, and shooting Jackie Crezzo, a woman who tried to help Maloney. Investigators are still searching for Maloney, whose bloody clothes were found under an Interstate 70 overpass. Cre uh, Crezzo remains hospitalized with bullet wounds in her spine. In January, a psychologist who had been treating Harlan in group therapy for a year wrote letters to Lakewood Probation Officer Nina Lilquist. 
at Lakewood Municipal uh, and Lakewood Municipal Judge Daniel Ramsey, according to the Post. Hey, by the way, if you guys didn't, you guys should go listen to that podcast on that case we talked about last night. I did. There's a lot more information in that in there that they got from the family members, and they did say it was just sort of a, you know, the the guy he claimed he had a stroke, you know, and then he had amnesia. Well, it was, there was no stroke or anything. It was just a psychological, like an event. And he just happened to get it one day before he was supposed to be doing another round of polygraph tests. And the, the brother said, I don't know what psychologist would have given him that. It's just like I said. It was like, I mean, it was like almost word for word what I was saying. It was crazy. But anyways, you guys should check that out. It's on The Vanished. It was their last one that they did. And no, I'm, I don't get any money for uh, telling you guys that. I just thought it was pretty good. It was interesting. Yeah, well, it was obvious. I mean, my God, really? The guy, oh, wow. I, I don't, I, now I can't remember anything up until I was 18. Really? It just it, and, and the day before, he's supposed to do a second polygraph test. He suddenly has this huge event that changes... He, he can't remember anything again. I mean, it's just a joke. And the fact that a psychologist signed off on it means that they really can't question him because he'll always be able to say, no, I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed. Anyways, it was really it was interesting. It's like an hour and 18 minutes long, a couple ads in there, but whatever. So in January, a psychologist who has been treating Harlan in group therapy for a year wrote letters to Lakewood Probation Officer Nina Lilquist and Lakewood Municipal Judge Daniel Ramsey, according to the Post. Both apparently were handled, handling a Lakewood assault case involving Harlan's ex-wife. Police also have reopened an unsolved 1988 case involving the kidnapping and murder of 21-year-old Jessica Arrendondo, who was Harlan's co-worker. See, isn't that crazy? He, this, this guy right here was the co-worker of Harlan at the casino, and he killed this other woman. Now, the, the crazy part is the similarities between the two. Uh, you know, I'm going to go straight to... The uh, article written by that guy, though. This one. And so the, the case that he was arrested for right here, they did catch him. He got uh, the death sentence for killing uh, that first individual that I mentioned. I can't remember her name right this second. Uh, he got the death sentence, and then the death sentence was overturned because apparently the jury... Uh, had the Bible in the uh, deliberation room, so he got life without parole. I, somehow that doesn't seem to make any sense. but And not that the death penalty means a damn thing in Colorado. So Okay, so here we go, everybody. This might take a little bit of time, but... An average of twice a year between 1975. Okay, what was interesting about this is this guy goes through and discusses a ton of different serial killers. Or not serial uh, cases that could be associated with serial killers. And Jessica actually shows up in one of these. But I kind of wanted to go through some of these on another day. I mean, look at all these. So we, we have her. We just did Stephanie Ann Bauman. That's the one that, that the crazy-ass hypothermia case where she was stripped and walked out in the frozen cold, beaten, and left to die. Yeah, but there's just tons of them. Look at this. And here's Jessica Arandando, one of the ones he talked about. And if you click on that, that'll actually go to her particular case. And here it is. So this guy, whoever, this guy right here, he's, uh, I mean, he's really kind of like a godsend for cold cases in Colorado. At least there's somebody that's putting all this stuff together 
so people can look it up. Thanksgiving, Aranda 21 was abducted, stripped, and was thrown or dumped from a moving car 60 miles away. She died of massive head injuries. Those who knew her recalled her as a bubbly, beautiful, beautiful young woman who had been the captain of her cheerleading squad at Denver's Abraham Lincoln High School. She loved dancing, played on her high school soccer team, and served on the student senate, according to a Denver Post article at the time. And again, this guy is Kirk Mitchell here. She had a boyfriend and worked at U.S. West as an operator. Jessica loved driving in her brand new red 1988 Mustang convertible that she had just bought with her own money, her father Joe Arando said. The car had a personalized license plate, 88 Pony, it said. One day she disappeared. She had just dropped her boyfriend off at a Glendale nightclub and drove away after a minor disagreement, according to a newspaper article. Okay, so on the day of the dis she disappeared, she had just dropped her boyfriend off at a Glendale nightclub and drove away after a minor disagreement. It's hard to know when someone says minor disagreement what that actually means. An eyewitness saw Jessica being followed or chased by two cars, Joe Arando said. He said the witness later drew a composite picture of the two suspects. And one of the drawings looked exactly like the... Uh, like Robert El El Elliot Harlan. Okay, and Maloney is the person that he got his death sentence for. However, they had to reverse it because there was a Bible somewhere. How dare they? Okay. Uh, Jessica's shiny new car was found at 11.25 p.m. with its blinkers on at East 7th Avenue and Jackson Street. So that's where we, we have that pin. Neighbors later reported hearing what sounded like an argument. Police theorized that Jessica's abductors crashed into her car intentionally and kidnapped her, according to news reports. The next morning, a Saturday, her family reported that she was missing. Later that afternoon, two passerbys were throwing snowballs along US 36, about eight miles southeast of Estes Park. Well, let's try to do this. Here we go. Not the greatest description in the world, but. Okay, and there's 36, and so let's see what that said again. Along 36, about eight miles southeast of Estes Park when they spotted a nude body about 50 feet from the roadway. Okay, so let's just, there's Estes Park and Highway 36 right there. South, so wait, did they say southwest now? No, hold on. No, eight miles southeast of Estes Park. So it's the other direction. So where does 36 go? Does it uh, loop around?
they call it again? US 36. So is this 36? Oh, there, okay, there's 36. So maybe it comes up. Seven, 66. Southeast, though. Oh, there's 36 right there. Okay, good. Wow, it's weird how it, it doesn't pop up sometimes. And you said eight miles. So they probably measure that driving. So I would say more like seven. It's pretty straight, but like 7.2. Just because it's winding around a little bit. Jessica's body fat. So this is kind of what it looked like in the area. Something like this. Yeah, I don't have the exact location, but. Okay, it was Jessica's remains. That's what that's what they found when they were throwing snowballs and boom, they found her body there. It was Jessica's remains. Her clothing was dumped along the highway. So it was just put, just thrown out the window as it, the car was moving. It was a spread out over a long range. Authorities saw two sets of footprints in the snow near the body. Tire tracks in a pullout area, well, maybe those footprints were the, the kids, right? I mean, that were playing, th the snowball fight. It looked like they tossed Jes Jessica's body over the edge. An autopsy did not reveal evidence of a rape, and it is speculated that they may have jumped unexpectedly in an escape, or she may have jumped in an escape attempt from the car and died when her... <coughs> Captures abandoned their plans and dumped her body. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me see. That doesn't even make any sense. She was missing. Uh, Authorities saw two sets of footprints in the snow near the body, tire tracks in a pullout area above indicated someone had backed up. Oh, I see. So maybe she jumped out, then they backed up to check, maybe even got out of the car to make sure, see if she was alive or not. It looked like they tossed Jessica's body over the edge. Okay, so they're saying that they actually stopped the car took her body and flung it over the side. I don't see any area that, well, I guess it could look like that where we were, let's see. It looked like one side did have a, not in this area, but. Yeah, like somewhere over here, you could easily see that. they. They pull over, flung her, and just flung her over. You see what I'm saying? I 
An autopsy did not re reveal evidence of a rape, and it is speculated that she may have jumped unexpectedly in an escape attempt from the car and died when her captures abandoned their plans and dumped her body. Let's see, I don't really get that sort of contradictory. An escaped attempt from the car and died abandoned their plans and dumped her body. Well, no, but she had an escape attempt. Not sure what you guys are saying there. That's sort of contradictory to itself. Yeah. I don't get that. Just over five years later, on February 12, 1994, Robert Harlan, 46, kidnapped 25-year-old Central Cocktail Waitress Rhonda Maloney. Now listen to this one, though. It sounds so similar. Uh, Harlan raped Maloney, 25, for a couple of hours near Interstate 76 and 25. Maloney managed to escape when motorist Jackie Creso slowed down after spotting two cars parked off the highway. Maloney jumped into Creso's car and told Creso she had been run off the road by a man with a gun who then raped her. So did you hear that? Her car was ran off the road. It was hit by the, another car. And then she was abducted from that car. And that sounds almost absolutely identical to the Jessica Arendo situation. She's driving her car, except in that one they said that there was multiple people in the vehicle, but maybe this guy was one of them. But you see how it's a very similar M.O. You hit the other vehicle, and, and this guy worked with Aren, uh, um, Arendando. So don't you think that's a little bit suspicious at that point? That's why they think this guy might have something to do with it. So Crizo drove toward Thornton. So in the car right now that Crizo's driving with um, Maloney in the vehicle, and she drove toward the Thornton Police Department with Harlow pursuing and he's firing into the fleeing car. Several bullets hit Crizo in the knee, spine, and face, paralyzing her and causing her to crash. Harlan pulled Maloney out of Crizo's car. I mean, just imagine this right here. This is so... The scene. Like, you're feeling like you're safe. Somebody, just uh, a good Samaritan's helping you out. And... This guy is such a maniac that he's shooting at them and ends up, you know, paralyzing the driver. Lucky she didn't die. I mean, literally hit with like four bullets. And then the car crashes. Harlan pulled Maloney out of Crizo's car, dragged her to his car, and drove away. Maloney's body was found seven days later under a bridge in eastern Adams County. Imagine the fear that uh, Maloney... I definitely would have given this guy the death penalty. And, and, and do you ever think, people, that maybe they brought those Bibles in because they were just like, this guy is a pure demon. You know, I mean, he is a monster. Okay? Uh, this guy should have got the death penalty. And it should have been... Um, executed quickly I mean he's a this guy is one of the worst of the worst right here normally you would let somebody go like okay okay go ahead go ahead you know when they got rescued you just try to get away but no he tracked them down firing over and over and over into that vehicle and then the car crashes and then Harlan pulls Maloney out of Crizo's car dragged her dragged her to his car and drove away. And then seven days later, under a bridge in eastern Adams County, her body was found. Jesus. Several people came forward and told police that Harlan had been an information operator at U.S. West Communication the past eight years and had worked with Arendando. See? See? It was very similar to my daughter's case, George Arandanda said. I do believe he killed my daughter. 
Later, 39 female employees of U.S. West Communications contended Harlan had for years sexually assaulted or sexually harassed them, and company officials did nothing to stop it. Yeah. The woman said Harlan made lewd comments to female co-workers, grabbed, touched, and harassed them. I mean, that's such a different level, though, to be honest with you. He brought a gun to work and showed it to his friends. Another time, a co-worker filed a restraining order against him for stalking her. Uh, that part right there, now you're starting to get kind of in a serious angle there. Uh, they said... Their fear intensified after Arundondo disappeared. The woman sought a $22 million settlement. The outcome of the claim is not known. Wow. They said their fear intensified after Arundondo. Okay. Harlan was sentenced to death for the Maloney's murder. His death sentence was later overturned on appeal after jurors consulted a Bible during deliberations. Yeah. It, what, what, they read the eye for an eye part? Jesus. That's Colorado for you right there. Joe Arandondo said if investigators ever find enough evidence, he wishes they would try him for murder. He warned that Harlan's accomplice has never been identified. Yeah, because remember there was... Uh, multiple people. You know, that is kind of interesting. Was there a guy with Harlan? Because it would be really difficult to get that accurate shooting with just being by yourself with that many shots. I could see pulling up on the side. Maybe he did just pull up by the side. But um, as, as you remember, multiple people got Arandondo into that vehicle. It's been a long time already. He said, I wish they could come up with some kind of evidence. I would al it would allow us to have some closure. Well, no, it wouldn't. Yeah, so this is an article that was from 1994 here where it mentions very, you know, some of the similarities just like that last article we just read. Arundondo's dented car was run off the road at an intersection and abandoned. Maloney's car also had fresh dent in it when it was found after she was kidnapped. These are the check marks of similarities here. Arundondo's clothes were strewn along a seven-mile stretch of road leading to the site where her body was found. Maloney's clothes were tossed by the side of a street under an interstate overpass her purse was found nearby um, early police composite sketches of the suspects in both cases were of a light-skinned black or hispanic male um, arandando 22 and maloney 25 were nude when their bodies were found so those are the similarities there and uh, you, you just have to realize that's got to be him right he worked at the same place come on hey good night kit kat Thanks for being the inspiration for the, the new uh, chocolate mint Kit Kat bar. And thank you for your super chats. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I do have one more case though. And I didn't, they're just done in um, chronological order. I didn't say, you know, pick one. Oh, wow, I'm going to keep this one for the last. Probably if I was going to do that, I would have kept Stephanie uh, Bauman. That one's nuts, right? I think you could do a, a really good podcast episode on that one. Probably not a full series, but... Definitely, unless you were trying to relate that to some other cases.
<laughs> Good night, Kit Kat. And this one, I it, I really have almost no information on it. The only thing is, is this guy's article. Okay. But this is a 1995 case. That's her. It's always so weird when you look at these people. You just look at them and they just look like anybody. Your friend or just somebody you might see out and about. But somebody murdered these people. It blows. So this is the... Um, this is the only thing that I could find on her. I might try looking into, put her name in a different place and try to find it, but let's see what it says here. It started as a missing persons case. The parents and family of Jennifer Sue, or Jenny Larson, desperately sought clues in her inexplicable disappearance. Larson was a reliable 21-year-old Metropolitan State College student who had a summer job working at the same plant that her father Earl worked at. Her father told reporters of the Rocky Mountain News that he was nervous when she didn't show up for work. When he went to her condominium and discovered that her cats had not been watered, it confirmed his worst fears. She loved animals. She was last seen about 3 a.m. on August 10, 1995, leaving the home of friends on the... Okay, let's put that in there. And that's in Aurora. So somewhere in this area here. I just want to take a look just to yeah, I mean, look, just look out absolutely normal, just typical neighborhood somewhere. So she was leaving the home of friends on the 17,300 block of East Layton Drive in Aurora. Aurora police put out bulletins seeking information about the girl who was 5 feet 8, 125 pounds, with hazel eyes and long brown hair and who sometimes wore glasses with metal rims. They, let's see, they offered descriptions of her car, a red two-door 1995 Toyota Tercel with Colorado license plate PAN6380. Her car was found abandoned in the parking lot of an apartment complex in the 400 block South Memphis Street. Okay, so let's see where how close that is. So it's not really that far from where the friends were. And that looks like an apartment con this None of these look like apartments, but this does. So I'm going to say that this is where the apartments were. Her car was found in here. Let's see how many pins 
in Colorado we got for tonight. Oh, well, there you go. So her car was found abandoned in the parking lot at an apartment complex in the 400 block of South Memphis Street, about a mile from her southeast Aurora condo, uh, condo <laughs> according to an article by former Denver Post reporter Marilyn Robinson. I haven't, couldn't find any of these. The car was unlocked. The keys were on the floor. Okay, so the car was unlocked. The keys were on the floor. And it was about a mile from her southeast Aurora condo, according to an article by former Denver Post uh, reporter Marilyn Robinson. The car was unlocked. The keys were on the floor. Police also found her shoes and socks in the car. So it's almost like somebody drove her car there later and sort of dumped the vehicle. The car was unlocked, the keys were on the floor. Police also found her shoes and socks in the car, which apparently had been there for more than a week. So the, they, hadn't, they didn't find the car for um, a while. Police intensified their search thereafter and asked for the public's help in locating the pretty young college student. Her father, Earl Larson, was beginning to lose hope. He told Robinson he was preparing for the worst possible outcome. The last time he had seen his daughter was about 3.30 p.m. the day before she went missing as she was leaving his job at the Chrysler Warehouse near Interstate 70. Jennifer was arriving for her shift. She had been working there for a summer job. They always checked in with her. Nearly two months later, a farmer was plowing his field southeast of Strasburg when he found a skeleton lying on its back. It was a half mile north of Quincy Avenue on Arapahoe County Road 161. Anyways, uh, and, it, and it turned out, that, let, let's see, Jennifer's the Cade remains were found on the edge of a sunflower field southeast of Strasburg, about 10 feet from a barbed wire fence. That's crazy. Let's get, let's figure out what this is. Okay, Quincy Avenue. And that sounds familiar. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds familiar because we we talked about it earlier. Th that's what I was just thinking. Didn't they? Didn't we have that in the earlier story? Look at this shit. Okay. Well, that's quint. Let's. Uh, and then one sixty one sounded familiar too. Hold on. Let me put this pin here. And then we've got, uh, man, that just got a little bit more interesting right there. Not that it wasn't, but I'm just saying. Wow. Are you kidding me? Wait, is this, what are we doing? This is a totally different person. Look at this, right on the same freaking uh, road. Well, now I can see why they think maybe these are related somehow. Hold on, let me just put this here. I mean, it's crazy because we even had that same information earlier. Remember they said, okay, start and then Quincy and 161st. I knew that sounded totally familiar. Nearly two months later, a farmer was plowing his field south. The, so this is this one here is in the exact place as 
Stephanie Bauman 15 years earlier. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah, John Benet. <laughs> a farmer was plowing his field southeast of Strasbourg when he found a skeleton lying on its back. It was half mile. Okay, let's get this exactly right here. A half mile north of Quincy Avenue. Wait a minute. On Arapahoe County Road, one that's right where it's like right here, right where the start of the other case was. Wow, right, what are the odds of that? I mean, I mean I'm looking at the right case here, right? I mean, yeah. This is uh, <laughs> Jennifer Larson. This is ridiculous right here. What, what's going on? And it's a half mile up this road right here. Watch this. You go right here, and then you go a half mile, and you're right there. So right at that, whatever that little change in color is. Hey, thanks, Robin Frost. Okay, well, that is totally crazy now. And this is where they say it began. <laughs> First, um, Stephanie... The names just don't pop in my head because I haven't covered it that much. But. Bauman, right? Thank you, Robin Frost. Oh, jeez. Well, I think they think a lot of these are related. But I mean, what? Are, that can't be coincidental right there. Look, let's go back to the Stephanie Bauman case and go just sort of pull up and where they're talking about it you know they get really specific in here yeah look at this according to Martin account reported by Parsons the girl's nightmare began near a rickety windmill and water trough filled with frozen water just off County Road 161 from there the girl walked briskly around to the road uh, dirt path to County Road 161. She walked on the left side of the road, which had shallow ditch beside it. Martin estimated it was about 4 a.m. She walked along 161 for about three tenths of a mile when she came to its intersection with Colorado 30. Yeah. See, she went this direction, and then here's Colorado 30, which is also Quincy uh, Quincy Drive, too, right? Remember that right around in this area it became, had a name on it? I can't see it now, but it was there earlier. That's 173. That's 161 right there. At least we know this is 161. And so that must be what that is. Wow. Yeah, Quincy Avenue, whatever. Uh, early, yeah, there, there it was right there. Quincy Avenue right there. So Quincy Avenue is 30th. It's the same, it's exactly the same spot. I mean, this is apparently where they found Jennifer Larson. Uh, I don't know if that's a sunflower field right there, but could be. That's right. The street view doesn't work right there. 
Huh. Well, that's uh, mind-boggling. That just two random cases that we talked about are like on the same freaking rural road out in the middle of nowhere. It's almost like the person was reliving something later. You know, almost like this is where it all began. Okay, let me let me get back to the right article now. I mean, it's just it's mind-boggling to me. But uh, go to page two. She was last seen at 3 a.m. on August 10th, leaving the home of friends. The offered description of her car. Um, her car was found abandoned. Her car was unlocked. Police intensified their search. Um, nearly two months later, a farmer was plowing his field southeast of Strauss, Strasburg when he found a skeleton lying on its back. It was half a mile north of Quincy Avenue in Arapahoe County Road 161. Jennifer's decayed remains were found on the edge of a sunflower field southeast of Strasburg, about 10 feet from a barbed wire fence. She was face down in the dirt. Well, I thought you said she was lying on her back up there. A farmer was plowing his field southeast of Strath when he found a skeleton lying on its back. And then right here you say, she was face down in the dirt. <laughs> See, I don't like shit like that. You know what I mean? I mean, a minute ago you just said she was on her back, and then now she's on her face. Small animals and insects had fed on the body. There were no, There was no clothing... There was no clothing near her remains. What was left of her body weighed 40 pounds. Her skin was mummified. A large clump of her scalp. I mean, I don't really care if she was on her back or on her stomach. It's, you know, she was, she was dead there, and that's really what mattered. A large clump of scalp hair was mixed with dirt, mold, and plants. A necklace with a teardrop-shaped metal pendant with a floral design had been found in the hair. Coroner Dr. Michael Doberson determined that the cause of death was homicidal violence of undetermined uh, etiology. The manner of death was homicide. A dentist used dental x-rays to identify her remains, according to Doberson's autopsy report. Then Captain Grayson Robinson said the evidence suggested that whoever her killer was had murdered her elsewhere and dumped the body in the field. See, that's why it's weird, because it's almost like they tried to dump Bauer there, Bowerman there, but she lived and they kept trying to like follow her around and they said, ah, screw it, she'll die. It's cold out. You know, something like that. Because it's in the exact same spot. But it's 15 years later, though, so, you know, maybe it was due to lore. Somebody knew that or, you know, I, I don't know. It's just very, the odds of that are like one in a million to be on that exact same spot right there. And this is a different case. Did you take off for a while there, Danette? We're on a totally different one. Then Captain Grayson Robinson said the evidence suggested that whoever her killer was had murdered her elsewhere and dumped the body in the field of sunflowers. Robinson has since been elected sheriff, but the case remained unsolved. Arapahoe County Sheriff Investigator Bruce Isaacson, who was assigned the case in 1995 is the cold case investigator on the case. Jenny's remains were cremated and later laid to rest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where she grew up. 
You know, hopefully they collected any DNA if they need it, but that's a little bit later. Oh, okay. Well, don't worry. Yeah, we're, we've done six cases, Danette. This one's crazy, though. If you go back and watch it, if you just got back, is the... Do uh, you remember the one we did early, earlier? Bowerman, who was nude and being followed on the dirt road and then walked like four miles and then died of hypothermia out in the snow or whatever it was. I don't know if it was snow, but just really cold um, outside. Well, it's the exact same spot that this case is. I mean, literally, like, I'm going to show you right here. Look, Bowerman, Stephanie Bowerman's case is right here, and she walked down like this and then around and then up. Jennifer Larson's body was found right there. That's a little bit weird. Especially when you consider, like, the city's way over there. There's Strauss, Strasburg that they kept talking about. Southeast, exactly where that is. You know, it's not way east, but... Yeah, what the hell is this, as they say. So, they don't really have any more information on her. I couldn't find any newspaper articles on her. I wonder if there was just something wrong with newspapers.com, because, man, it literally almost every case had no mention of anybody. Yeah. Man, that's mind boggling. Man. Yeah. So Stephanie was here, went this direction, then this direction, and then up here. But on that exact same road. See, here, here's what's weird about it. Is Stephanie Bowerman walked in her little the journey that she took. She literally walked, or excuse me, Bowman, not Bowerman, Bowman. She absolutely walked right by where Jennifer's body would be found 15 years later on her ju journey walking nude. So she's walking this way and walks right by where Jennifer Larson's body is found 15 years later. In the middle of absolutely nowhere. I mean, just look at it like this. What are the odds of that? Yeah, well, it took a while to go through it all. Hope you guys thought that that was interesting. But those are the six cases in Colorado that we were going to discuss tonight. And it took a while, but, man, I thought, you know, basically every single one of them was interesting, right? Some of them had way less information, but, man. And that one writer uh, that collects all that data, he's awesome. So... Shout out to Kirk Mitchell, the crime reporter, for the Denver Post. You know, so you can find the cases, and then he has a deeper story on some, and some he doesn't. Yeah, Colorado, I don't, I, you know, not looking too good. Beautiful state, but. Thank you, Danette Costa. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I do put pe I do put uh, put people to sleep often on this show. Hey, look at that! It says you've been a member for three months. Who was that?
So all of the yellow pins are what we did tonight. Yep. So that all of those six cases were in that this area right here. Which in itself is mildly interesting if you think about it. I mean, Colorado's a pretty big state. Maybe that's where all the big cities are, I guess. Hey, here's a new new place to fly around that doesn't look too bad. There we go. Yes, everybody hit that like button. Yeah, I don't really... Canyons and rocks are the only thing that that look good on uh, YouTube. I mean, on Google Earth, excuse me. Uh, when you have trees, you know, just in general, they don't model that out. Sometimes in these areas, they model the individual trees. See, this isn't even the high quality model. I can tell by looking at the rocks there. But maybe right over there is, I don't know. Hey, thanks Lillian Plummer. I almost want to call their cold case unit over there and ask them some questions. You know? <laughs> they got a lot of weirdness going on over there. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do the... Uh fly by here in a minute but I want to say thank you to Angela McLaughlin and if you are, aren't a channel member you should th uh, think of doing it you get access to all of the um, the emojis that I've made custom emojis oh it was it Miley yeah Miley Harmon I remembered Andrea Ruggiero Drum Chrissy Paradis, Kit Kat, Rochelle Black. Oh, and then Helen Mitchell did become a member. Thank you very much. Linda Howell, Helen Mitchell, and then Helen Mitchell again with Super Chats. Kit Kat, Claudia Neubauer, Wally Gator, Trace Elements 13, Jen Richards again. Thank you very much. Robin Frost, <coughs> oh, excuse me, no, it's not coronavirus, Danette Costa, and Lillian Plummer, thank you very much. <laughs> wow, I come back to the chat, look at all those crazy emojis up there, that's right. And for those of you who don't know, there's a join button next to the, uh, underneath the video, like next to the subscribe button. Oh, you have to take the test, huh? Jeez. Well, let's just say this. My little cough there, I don't know if it was, but I also am prone to allergies this time of year. They actually make me feel kind of shitty in general. Cannoli dip.
Being in Mars, everybody. Well, how do you know what it's like? Asymptomatic people. Okay, now I gotta go back to my, my favorite place. Because it's not too far away from there. But... Oh, yeah.
know, the name of this song is actually Furious Freaks. What do you think the odds of that were? was flat. <laughs> Wouldn't they just had a long board right there? Jesus. Oh well. No gray. Google Earth is they're in on it too. Anyways everybody thank you very much for showing up tonight. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for the support. Uh, okay everybody uh, thank you again for showing up. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Gray, Gray, Daddy told you to not have music. I'll speak for Gray. He doesn't give two shits what she said. Oh, goody! I like the music! Yay! Oh, I, I figured you liked that, that one. Mary Lou, well, you have yourself a good night, okay? Okay, good night, John Boy. Alright, good night.